following pictures taken at the risk of his life were procured for curiosities by a member of the Marine Guard. The hideous voodoo ceremonies are held in secret and varied locations. The ceremony begins at sundown and continues all night, becoming wilder and wilder as the fanatical dancers work themselves into a religious frenzy. At midnight, the supreme sacrifice is made, during which a child of three or four years of age is killed and eaten. Children for the sacrifice are plentiful because it is considered the greatest honor of voodooism to be chosen as the mother of a sacrificial victim to the serpent worshiper. No, we're not crazy. No, we're not going in some backwoods sacrificing any babies or anything like that. No, we're not digging up any of your people's graves or any of that stuff. We are practicing a legitimate religion. Well, the thing about voodoo, they, they, they can get a voodoo doll, like the voodoo doll here, and just stick pins in it. In Hollywood, they do that. In the movies, they do that to make money off of it. But voodoo is a religion. Voodoo is feared because uh, it is not part of the mainstream religions and people tend to fear what they don't understand. birthplace of jazz, a city famous for spicy foods, majestic architecture, and colorful history. But part of that rich tradition is a faith among many New Orleanians in the power of charms and spells, gree-gree bags and voodoo dolls. We had a lady in our neighborhood, and she wore this rag around her head. And when these people would go there, most of them would leave with this little drawstring and this little bag hanging around their neck, you know. And this was to drive off evil spirits and bring good luck. So one day, we found one of those little white bags, you know. Inside was uh, a rock, a piece of pine wood, and a chicken foot. Just one finger off the chicken foot. So there was a lot of mojo bags going around, lucky handbags going around. A lot of people with card games in their house who used, you know, uh, something to try to keep the money in the house instead of some winner taking all the winnings out of the house. There was always someone who realized that the people who owned the house, owned the card game, were using something, so they'd need to use something to kind of act that, so they'd be going into the game with a mojo hand, and the work just perpetuates itself. You see what I'm saying? Hexes and good luck charms are deeply rooted in New Orleans culture, but they're only a small part of the local practice of voodoo, a religion brought over from the old country by the slaves. The origins of the religion of voodoo are in Africa. The two main branches in the world of what we know today as voodoo are Dahomey, which is now the Republic of Benin, and southwestern Nigeria. And from Dahomey, we get the religion of voodoo, the manifestations of which are in Haiti and also in New Orleans. And, we, and from the Yoruba religion of Nigeria, we get uh, religions like um, Santeria, we get Candomblé of Brazil, uh, the Shango Baptist of Trinidad, but the cosmology and the belief system in the voodoo in Europe are basically the same. Voodoo is an evolution of African shamanism, which been, has been recreated in the Western world, mainly in Haiti. Voodoo is really a generic term for a number of uh, metaphysical practices. And voodoo literally means spirit, deity, and God, the creator of the universe. 
we believe in God, but under this God force, there are many spirits, forces, and deities that are called the voodoo gods and goddesses, um, the Loas, or the Orisha. The natural forces uh, which build the universe are earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, the deities are a personification of these four elements. The voodoo gods, uh, the Yoruba gods, are very, very much equated with the forces of nature. Uh, for example, I am a priestess of Oya uh, in the Yoruba religion, and Oya is the goddess of the winds and the hurricanes, and she is the queen of the spirit world. Main spirits would be Papa Legba, who's the intermediary between the metaphysical world and the physical world. You have Dambala, who is the spiritual sovereign or the high spiritual deity of Voodoo. You have Ogun, which is the spirit of war, and you have Baron Samadhi, which is the spirit of the dead and magic. The African concept of death is not finite like it can be in some terms of the West because people in the West sometimes tend to view death as being a period, punctually, whereas Africans tend to, be, tend to view death as being a comma, you know, a brief respite and a continuation of the same thought on the other side. And uh, the African has, according to Voodoo, has managed to master the spiritual plane in order to manipulate things on the physical plane. So in, in voodoo, the dead are not dead. There are a living spirits without bodies. And that heaven and hell are not, he, heaven is not in the sky, hell is not on earth. It's right within the same dimension. So the reality is multi-dimensional. People believe that they can pray to their ancestors, people who lived on the planet, who are of their bloodline, who share their same sympathies, and maybe working out the same familial karma. They believe that these people can decide, you know, intercede in behalf of them while they're still on the planet. Vodun is a way of life. Vodun is the way of thinking, is the way of behavior. Health and prosperity in all you do. And for this to be affirmed five times the sacred number of Oshun, I shake. The people that are practicing voodoo uh, are not doing it on uh, Sunday only. This is an everyday affair. Um, this is waking up with the loas or spirit forces, um, going to bed at night thinking about the loas. Um, this is honoring the Loas in every step of your life. It's involved in becoming in tune, in tune with oneself, with that inner spirit, because each and every one of us are, are blessed with that inner spirit. Though often dismissed as primitive superstition, the religious symbols of voodoo and its country cousin hoodoo have long been a lightning rod for fear and suspicion. The skull, the snake, um, these are things people associate with voodoo, even the doll. And these all have legitimate symbolic reasons for being a part of the religious ceremonies of voodoo. But because people don't know what those um, meanings are, they place their own meanings on them. Well, in my religion, the snake is evil. So that means voodooists are evil. In my religion, skulls mean death. So the voodooists adore death. Um, and then they throw the cross in there. How dare them? That's our symbol. The crossroads. Here you have the, the sign of the crossroads, which is the cross. It is um, the domain of um, Ilegba, Papa Legba, who is the god of the crossroads. It is where uh, heaven and earth meet. And uh, so the, the, the symbol of the cross uh, is a very, very uh, powerful symbol in, in voodoo. Then we've got the skull, um, another really scary looking symbol that you'll see in most rituals. It's not about the bones, it's about what it symbolizes. 
and the skull symbolizes the ancestors. And ancestral worship is a very, very important part of voodoo. This is the cycle of life. The serpent represents the voodoo god Dambala, who is all about wisdom. He's an ancient deity. The fear um, of voodoo is also perpetrated, say, by the creation myth and the Christian religion. The Adam and Eve story and the serpent doing uh, uh, the, the tempting of woman. One of the things people get very confused about is the snake dance, which is done by normally a female. And that is just a physical representation of that spiritual balance between that masculine energy coming from the sky, the snake, and the woman symbolizing the earth. So that's where the snake comes in, um, you know, representing wisdom, light, energy, balance. Um, all good stuff. And when we think about trying to connect our thoughts to a ritual object of focus, no different than a Christian feels that their prayers are more powerful when they're looking at a cross. You know, that when we have an object to focus on, it's not the object itself, rather than what the object represents for us inside of our consciousness as human beings. Fantastic legends surround the most famous symbol of New Orleans voodoo, the doll. But if one discards the myths invented to frighten children and entertain tourists, the African roots of local voodoo dolls are revealed. We use doll in all of those items, but not especially dolls. But do we use doll also? But not specially. What you have are some objects, some ritual objects, whereby the, the um, the, put, the placing of nails or metal objects into them is a way to tap into some power. There are a lot of things that are made to affect reality, and many of them are made for healing. You see figures that have been wrapped. You might even find someone's hair or fingernails. You may find other kinds of parts of animals or herbs that have to do with healing what the particular problem is. It is not to be construed as something that um, you're trying to wreak a vengeance or a harm or havoc upon someone. But by the time it gets to New Orleans and it gets mixed with European superstition, European witchcraft, then these little dolls, which had to be constructed to um, distinguish them from the ritual objects in Africa where they came from, then there's this notion of um, um, mixing this with magic and then being able to hurt someone. This doll here is made, I uh, uh, put on my altar and I, bless, I put a spirit in this doll, a real live spirit into this doll. This doll is going to be for anyone, but before I give it to him, I hold their hand and I say a prayer. And that way the doll is, is for that person only. When I was born, God gave me a gift uh, to heal and to help people, you know, and um, if I, if I misuse it, use it for, for bad things, I lose it. God will take it away from me. There are people who call me all the time because they want negative things done. And I tell them under no circumstances for any amount of money will I do anything negative. Because you do reap what you sow. You cannot do an evil work or invoke an evil spirit to hurt someone and attempt to build a circle of protection around yourself. I would be rich if I... Um, were to cater to the demands of people who want evil work. I think people are impressed by acts of power. To be able to strike out at someone without physically touching them. We're fascinated by those kind of things as human beings, and it's, it's more dramatic. It's not long, quick, drawn, a long, drawn out work. This is quick, fast, hurry. The kind of society we lived in being geared the way it is, we, we like that, quick fixes. So that's the kind of thing it looks like. It looks like a quick fix. Oh, you hurt me? I'll put a curse on you and take care of this right away. So in the voodoo sense of, uh, of life, life is not a clash of good and evil, it's a blend of good and evil. Because there are some situations uh, where it's justifiable that you have to use evil to right or wrong. If someone slaps your face, you're not going to give them a bouquet of roses. <laughs> there are times when human beings who have done things that are so out of balance need to be placed within check because of that imbalance. And we have to understand that evil is relative. 
that voodoo is not inherently evil is that if we want to say something is evil we can say that the guy selling drugs on the street is evil or or the drive-by shooting is evil <laughs> or maybe racism is evil so we you know we have to you know look as evil as being relative the importance again of karma that what you do you know it's going to come back to you things that you wouldn't want to be done on to you then don't do it to others what they said when you point one finger at what one per at a person remember look at how many coming back to you four okay so when you sit there and wish this person bad remember it's going to come back to you four times so be careful everything i do is it works yeah george bush came to see me we're running for president now. and that's when i it was my busy week bush came to see me I did it for him. I told him he's going to be the president. He's going to win by a landslide. Now that he came to see me, uh, David Duke came to, <laughs> he came to see me. <laughs> he wanted me to help him be governor. But um, I had a change of mind there, you know. In voodoo, the real power of voodoo is the power of the human mind. In all religions, in reality, are belief systems. I make uh, some different type of oil and perfumes. Love me all. Uh, when you use it, I love my the lady when I love you. I got some other type of oil for luck. I got lucky dog. I mix it for the purpose that you need. Or sometimes I go use it myself personally for the purpose. If I use it for me, it works. It, it has to work for somebody else. Voodoo is like chiropractor. You have to believe in it for it to do you any good, really. I think it does take belief to make it effective. You know, belief and luck. <laughs> now, I could make a mojo bag or a Grigory bag for job. But, you know, let's face it, the spirit is not going to come out here and fill out an application for you. You have to go out there and do that yourself. So, whenever I make a Grigory bag, I'm invoking spirit forces, the God and the good spirit forces, also the Christ spirit to help. But in addition to invoking them, I am directing my thoughts and my energies out to pull to me in a very positive way, exactly what I see, and it does work. I uh, had a gentleman who came to me in tears because there was a certain lady he was uh, dating, and. For some reason, she had dumped him, and he was all in tears. So I told him, I said, look, uh, you want to get back in good graces? I said, you have to use some magic. So I had him stand in front of all the night. I told him to light a come-to-me candle. We dressed it and sprinkled hair in the candle. And I told him to tie his underwear around the woman's underwear to tie her up sexually. And we took the woman's picture and set the candle on top of the picture. And I told him to visualize send his energy, communicate with his subconscious mind to the woman's subconscious mind. So I said, well, look, now, now you can go back and make love to her and be back in her good graces. And he did it, and everything worked out perfectly. They call this a mojo bag, OK? This is like to win a lo uh, the lottery, love drawing bag. You're supposed to okay, you take like one of these, OK? And uh, we also had the oils, and uh, this is supposed to draw a love to you. And you just go like one, two, three times over here, one, two, three times over here, and then you keep this little mojo bag in your purse, okay? And that's supposed to help you to draw love to you. A lot of guys come in that, man, I, I, I see this girl and I'm in love with her and I want her, you know. It's okay, I make him a little, a little potion, a little gravy bag to go in their pocket. I said, but now when you get her, I said, you're on your own. Don't come to me to try to get rid of her because I can't. Once you got it, you got it, you're hooked, and that's it. They call it a breakup candle, okay? It's a candle with this snake. Like her husband is messing, messing with somebody else, okay? They want to break that relationship. So they go ahead and light this candle with both of the names, and uh, it should help. There are many, many thousands of people who are native-born New Orleans people that still burn candles. 
in their homes. The candles are, well, one thing was, a, a red candle was to bring love, a pink candle was to bring peace, I believe, a green candle was to bring money. You know? I burn a green candle too sometimes. <laughs> it's just an old belief, you know? Well, <laughs> don't bring any money, but... <laughs> a candle can warm us. A candle can give light. Above and beyond that, a candle cannot do anything. But people believe that by burning a green candle, they'll get money. By burning a, a black candle, uh, they can put bad luck on someone, which is absolutely stupid. No thing has any power beyond what the world of a physical realm has within it. But people become superstitious in burning candles and forgetting that it's only God who gives whatever is given. And it's certainly not a candle. New Orleans voodoo evolved into its present form during its difficult journey from Africa to the New World. We have at least three or four phases um, that the original religion has gone through um, to get to where we are today in what is commonly referred to as voodoo. We have the religion as it originated in Dahomey, where there is a complete spiritual hierarchy moving from West Africa to the Caribbean, then you have a fusion that takes place with Roman Catholicism. The European uh, element gets in and says, aha, this looks like something I've seen before. And we then begin to get this notion of this African religion being combined with notions of witchcraft, which are basically European in origin. So that by the time now that this religion moves to New Orleans, it has changed again. The African voodoo came in, you know, with the arrival of the slave, but due to the harsh cruelties of slavery, the Haitian uh, more or less came up with a new element, which was more of an, a more aggressive, militant, sorceress, magical type voodoo which fits the new world situation because <laughs> the African voodoo is very uh, passive, very religious and laid back. <laughs> Again in those African religions in context and in culture there was a balance. Here in the new world those who are the adherents and the worshipers of that tradition um, do in fact look to maintain their own equilibrium but they have an enemy to have an oppressor. This new, more militant voodoo was instrumental in the 1791 slave revolt that eventually created in Haiti the New World's second independent republic after the United States. It unified the people who revolted. They had a common religious base, despite the fact that it had a Catholic appearance in, in, in some cases. Uh, in those areas where where the Europeans were so well outnumbered, they couldn't stop it. Many of the French planters left Haiti to go to Cuba, then from Cuba to New Orleans, and at the time, uh, Governor Galvez was in power, and he did bring about a ban or restriction on the number of slaves coming from the Caribbean, mainly because they were afraid of uh, the same type of revolt happening here in the United States. From America to Haiti to France, revolution was in the air. After the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, New Orleans' new American masters were fearful not only of the strangeness of voodoo, but also of its potential role in rebellion. Then you had Americans coming in to run it. They were coming in with more restrictions and they were dealing with a large number of people who had immigrated here as a result of an act of revolution. And you had folk here who were willing to revolt, who were willing to fight. They had to do everything that they could to keep that down, to suppress that. So rules were written that you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. Um, black Creole women were made to wear tions on their hair because the white women in the colony said, uh-uh, you look too much like us. So we have to draw the line somewhere. 
In New Orleans, the line was drawn at Congo Square, behind the city at the edge of the swamp, where on Sundays slaves were allowed to freely gather. One of the reasons that the dance actually became a part of Congo Square was because the dance was being raided anywhere outside of Congo Square. So Congo Square was being given to allow Africans to gather, congregate, dance, to enjoy their rituals, but not too much, but just a way to safety valve everything. Around the turn of the century, it got so bad, uh, uh, Louisianians got more and more Americanized that, um, and they got so, so, such of this religious uh, fanaticism, and it, it just forced voodoo underground. Of course, they emerged into spiritual churches and uh, little shops. I would say up until the early part of the 20th century, that there are accounts in the newspapers, including the Times Picayune, of the police raiding voodoo rituals. So with a history like that, no one feels the responsibility to become above ground. <laughs> no one feels like, we, oh, we need to take this out to the surface where everyone can see it. No, it has seen the light of day many a times and paid dearly for it. Voodoo largely stayed intact because of women. I think when, you were, when you're faced with a situation where you're being severely persecuted for practicing a religion that was okay to practice back home in Africa, and you're having to hide it, I, women, are the, women keep secrets. Um, I mean, uh, we do. You know, we, we're good at keeping secrets. We are good storytellers. We can hold on to information. We pass it down to our children. Of all the women who practice voodoo in New Orleans, one is acknowledged as the voodoo queen. Her name was Marie Laveau. About her life, little is certain. In fact, two distinct stories emerge from her obituaries. Uh, one of them, and these were like days apart in the same newspaper, right? One of them had this like description of the Marie Laveau that probably most people think of, you know, this sort of daughter of Satan who conducts these rituals along Bayou St. John and they're, they're uh, sexy and you know, people are, there's bloody chicken's feet and, you know, there's all these horrible uh, uh, anti-religious uh, symbolism and activities going on. And, uh, and the other one was like an entirely different person. It was like she was raised in the Catholic Church. She was brought up in, at least for a time, in the Ursuline convent. Uh, Father oh, Père Antoine, who was one of the most beloved priests in the whole history of the city, uh, took her under his wing. She prayed with him for yellow fever victims. Many of the legends of Marie Laveau were popularized by Robert Talent in Voodoo in New Orleans. According to the book, she procured young Creole women for the sons of wealthy planters for rendezvous at her lakefront retreat called Maison Blanche, the White House. She was probably involved in some matchmaking. Now, if it led to any uh, sexual uh, encounters, well, I guess that would be left up to the two people. Red devil juice. <sighs> <laughs> her occult rituals would bring good fortune to her friends and trouble to her enemies, all at a time before the Civil War when women, especially women of color, were usually relegated to helpless dependency. She was a free woman of color, you know, and by a free woman of color, even though she had black ancestry, black blood in her, she was not a slave. You know, she was a businesswoman. And uh, sure, she combined the commercial aspects of voodoo with the spiritual. She was a hairdresser by trade, and she had other people working for her. And the hairdressers were one point of entry into this very closed Creole society, where people would, while they're having their hair fixed in their homes, would rattle on and on and on about so-and-so is seeing so-and-so, and they didn't care, you know, that their quadroon hairdresser is hearing all this because they're part of Creole society. So, of course, you get a lot of, I mean, the things you'll tell a barber, the things you'll tell a bartender you, that you won't tell your best friend are amazing. You just figure, well, what harm can they do? In that way, she collected a lot of information, and I think she used that information to control 
some judges to influence uh, judges because uh, it's just like the White House today. People who've got inside information have a lot of power because <laughs> people want that information and other people don't want them to have it. I feel that even though she was privy to this information, that her main source of help to the people was spiritual, not insider information that she got, even though you will read this. But I read everything that is written about Marie Laveau with a grain of salt. The possibility that this tomb in St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 holds the remains of Marie Laveau has made it a mecca for voodooists and tourists from around the world. They tell me that take a red brick, three axes, turn around three times, and knock three times. She can actually do this. Historically, people have gone to St. Louis number one cemetery and the cemetery and our, her grave is supposed to be in there. But you hear through the grapevine coming up that she is not there at all. But what is important, whether her remains are spatially there or not, is that her spirit is being invoked and the spirit lives on and that's real. I always uh, ask her for things, pray to her, and um, we always honor her in all of our rituals uh, because she was a great voodooist, a great New Orleanian, and a great woman of history. Her gravesite is not the only thing in dispute. Supposedly, after she was buried in 1881, she continued and expanded her voodoo practice. Well, what happened is that there was Marie Laveau, and her daughter. And so when one died, the other just assumed the identity, which made it look like she was living forever. It was her daughter, apparently, who really got into uh, mail order, gree gree, and sticking pins and dolls. I mean, none of that stuff has really anything to do with voodoo. In New Orleans, Voodoo supplies have grown into an industry that spreads beyond spiritual shops into neighborhood grocery stores. We sell a lot of these candles through any customers. It doesn't have to be tourists only. The neighborhood over here uh, buys all these candles, Spanish, uh, black, white, you know. But the widest selection of spiritual supplies is to be found in specialty shops. But even to the open-minded, many items seem to have outlandish purposes. When you go into a lot of these so-called, and I do see it, so-called voodoo shops, you will find um, a, a plethora of all kind of voodoo paraphernalia. Some of these things are obviously meant as larks or joke. Shut your mouth, wash. People laugh at this. The discerning person can tell uh, what is actually meant as a spiritual aid and what is used as a lark. I make potions myself. I'll make grigory bags, but I do not make them as a joke. I try to put traditionally what goes in each. I will pray over it to empower it, and then I will show my client how to use it with visualization, with prayer and meditation. People fear voodoo because there's so little accurate information about voodoo that the general public is exposed to. I mean, we assume so much about what we see on TV and read in books. The written word is final. What we see on TV is fact. Evil sells. Satan sells. So why not take advantage of the misinformed public? image of this religion and make money off of it. People who are trying to make money and to turn a fast buck will not present truly what voodoo is about. But um, so they will just do all kind of things as voodoo, which is truly not voodoo at all. It is just an effort to turn a buck. Just because this is New Orleans doesn't mean that the general public here is more enlightened about voodoo than anywhere else in the world. To the contrary, 
people are not informed about this religion. There are too many people who don't dabble in what is an element of voodoo now and then. You wouldn't say it's a voodoo practice, but to say that they do not take a couple of elements out of voodoo for their personal convenience or well-being or good feeling about themselves. I would say it happens to a lot of people. Voodoo probably has more practitioners now than it ever has been. But it's unlike places or organizations, religious organizations that have temples and very many things that are above ground and surface so you can actually tell from the amount of churches in your area or the amount of new temples growing in the area or how many evan voodoo evangelists on TV so, you know, giving up the latest sermon or whatever that, that you can measure by those means. Today voodoo has changed um, from what it was, say, centuries ago in that it is more a personal thing. Some people will come to me for matters of love and matters of the heart. And a lot of the people that I work with are very private people. A lot of them are very public people, so privacy is essential. They just want the help, and I'm here to give it, and also to respect their right of privacy. If someone did go to a job interview and filled out an application and the religion is asked for, who's going to put voodoo? Who feels comfortable enough um, with the public attitude towards this religion, um, a public that doesn't even know this is a religion? I have spent a lot of time explaining to people that this, this is not about devil worship. It is not about putting hexes on people or hurting or harming people. No, <clears throat> I will not break up anybody's marriage because you want this man or this woman. No, I cannot kill somebody just because you don't want to divorce them and lose half of your money. No, but if you want to seek positive self-help, yes. I will help you with that. I will help you become more in tune with your spirit and with God. Yes, I will do that. Because I'm just as peaceful, you know, because this is what it's all about. And just as loving, because that's what life is all about. And this is what Christ teaches, and that is love. And that's what Votum is all about, peace, love. It's not about harming anybody. Voodoo has often been the cause of local dispute. In 1992, when a suburban New Orleans school board banned the book Voodoo and Hoodoo from a junior high school library because it included recipes for spells, the case erupted into a battle over freedom of speech and educational principles. Four years later, the courts returned the book to the library, but allowed the school to require parental consent before a student could delve into its secrets. In 1991, controversy had flared up in an unexpected quarter as the naming of a new local beer pitted state against state. I wanted a name that would reflect part of our heritage down here in Louisiana. I wanted a name that would be different and conjure up images of mystery and uh, just something really special. So Dixie Brewery christened their new product, Black and Voodoo Lager. In Texas, we had a little bit of a problem. They banned it. They said that we couldn't cross the state line and bring this voodoo beer into Texas because it had skeletons on the label. He must have had a few too many voodoos because there are no skeletons on the label. There was a public outcry and also the Louisiana legislature uh, introduced a bill to ban Lone Star in Louisiana because they thought it was very unfair what Texas was trying to do to us. And uh, it was picked up all over in the press and uh, they finally relented and allowed the voodoo beer in and the press was waiting at the state line. It was wonderful. Probably the most infamous of all New Orleans voodooists bills himself as the king of voodoo, but he is better known as Chicken Man. And I was biting the head off the chicken, you know. 
that was part of uh, my voodoo rituals and nightclubs. And um, you know, the chicken in the glass and the, eating the fire and the needles to the throat. And uh, the SPCA got me. They, they put a charge on me. It said, uh, causing her said chicken deep physical pains. Like they was the chicken, like they, like, like they felt the pain. I also walked in, he said, chicken man, I'm sorry, but I don't want to do this now. Don't put nothing on me. <laughs> don't get mad at me. She said, I got to take you downtown. So they kept me downtown, went to court. So they, they threw the whole thing out of court. It was my religion, you know. Then again, I was doing a voodoo show out there in Kenna. And I was a Popeye fried chicken there. I was booked for a week. And what nobody about Popeye's fried chicken for a week. <laughs> And it made them mad. <laughs> they was, a, I mean, they was, it was actually steaming. We got to get rid of him. He's running our business. He's running our biting live chicken head on. Don't nobody, don't nobody bite on chicken. And Copeland got really mad at that. He really got, really got highly pissed. I didn't care. So I did, a, I did a show just for the spite of it. Eventually, Chicken Man gave up his nightclub bag. I just got tired of biting chicken head off. <laughs> got kind of funky, you know. <laughs> so I just, I just said, later for the chicken. Exotic, barbaric, the cult of voodoo. Brought to Haiti from Africa centuries ago by Negro slaves, the cult of voodoo embodies the worship and fear of devil gods. Whole communities believing themselves under an evil spell indulge in wild orgies to cleanse themselves, invoke benign spirits. And Iraq rooms in Harlem continues in all its primitive savagery and superstition, the witchcraft of the African Congo. Most voodoo rituals are much less extreme than the nightclub acts of Chicken Man or of those portrayed in this March of Time newsreel. I am a uh, an authentic voodoo and Yoruba priestess. I counsel people spiritually. Uh, yeah, I make talismans, I make Grigri bag, and I do ritual work. Sometimes I work at the crossroads. I work right here in my temple. I may do cleansings and ritual work in the cemetery. Uh, at the river, I do ritual work for love there often, at the, right at our own Mississippi River. This ritual is to the voodoo goddess Oshun. The cigars, the flowers, the rum, the offerings of fruit and food are things that we put up in the temple um, for the Orishas. And we offer each Orisha something different. And these are things that they, they like. Like for uh, Alegba, we offer him hard candies, cigars and rum or gin to Oshun, who is the goddess of the rivers of wealth, health, money, beauty, and love. We offer honey, champagne, and peach wine. Long, long practiced by all religions that you appeal to the body, and by appealing to the body, you reach the soul. And St. Thomas Aquinas said that way back centuries ago. Supernature builds on nature. The physical part of that being the water, the words, and the ritual, the cleansing. And of course, this cleansing we find everywhere. We find among the Hindus and among the Africans. It's around the world. People want to be cleansed by water. And the symbolism is that God cleanses us. And God cleanses us through our human nature, but God works, of course, through supernature. This ritual is called a bimbe. It is an annual celebration of Ava K. Jones's initiation as a priestess. Spiritual cleaning is an important part of all voodoo rituals. 
But like many other aspects of voodoo, the methods used can be unsettlingly different. Blowing smoke in your face again, the smoke of the cigar again, this is a way of cleaning. Remember, you're, all, you're not only getting rid of that negative energy, but you're also, you know, uh, you're also channeling in positive energy around that person that you're cleaning. The mind is a very powerful thing, and you can pick up uh, a negative aura, a, a negativity around you by people just directing that to you with their mind. And so what we do in a cleaning is we remove that energy from you to uplift that spirit. The purpose of the drums are to call the loa or to invite the loa. In certain rhythms, what they do, they alter the consciousness of the believer where the believer goes into a, a, what we call a state of trance or possession to invite the lower into his body so that his body can be a receptacle for that energy or that force or that intelligence. Ritual possession by a lower is the ultimate goal in many voodoo rituals. For that Bembe, the spirit took this child over completely. I was really surprised. I mean, I was really, pet matter of fact, I was scared. I was petrified. I said, oh, my God. And it was unbelievable. And what happened was in her situation, she lays on the ground, you know. And while you come there, you kneel and you would, um, you would kneel before her or you would lay before her and she would pass her hands over you. And what that does too also, while she's passing her hands, she's also cleaning you, you know. And when she got out of it, she didn't remember anything. She doesn't, she doesn't even remember the fact that she was on that floor. In New Orleans, one of the grandest rituals occurs at the height of the voodoo calendar which also happens to be a Catholic holiday, St. John's Eve. St. John's Eve is celebrated on June 23rd, and somehow it became mixed, this phenomenon of the summer solstice became mixed with uh, the voodoo tradition of honoring St. John, but it's the, the voodoo tradition, the Catholic tradition, and the European tradition of uh, dealing with the summer solstice became intermeshed. And it became transformed into the voodoo holiday. Most practicing voodooists have altars in their homes. Altars that usually include Catholic icons. New Orleans is a predominantly Catholic city, and most voodooists are also practicing Catholics, to the dismay of church officials. Catholics make the best voodooists because they ask the saints to intervene with the Lord on their behalf. When you go to church, in the Catholic Church, you're lighting a candle, the same thing as your altar at home. You're just not going into a church. You, you have your altar at home. I go to the St. Anne Shrine. I love the St. Anne Shrine. It, it, it's peaceful. It's serene. You know, I can go there, and I can pray, and I can light a candle. I'm still calling higher beings. Santa Barbara helps me. Like when I'm without a job, she constantly brings money to me, keeps me with money. So an expedite does things, he, he's a saint that does things quickly. When you want something, like yesterday it comes. They say that when he does you your favor, that you bring a piece of pound cake, a brand new penny, fern, and a special gift you leave at the foot of the base of him after he gives you what you, what you wish for. Um, at 
at the shrine. The saints' pictures, the candles, the holy water is everything that I have here and everything you'll find in the Catholic Church. So I don't know what the hoopla is that they, they say voodoo is so bad because they have the same things. Candles, and they sell candles. How about candles from the shrine? Seven-day candles. And you can leave them there to burn. And the two ladies that work there, they'll pray. They'll write whatever you desire. So you talk about voodoo? <laughs> Officially, the church does not recognize voodoo as compatible with Catholicism, although not all priests agree. All due respect to the higher authorities in the church, I think the fear is unfounded. It's almost like a foolish husband who keeps telling his wife, I don't want you talking to those other men. Why should he fear that she talks to other men? He should be proud that other men want to share her company, her conversation. He should be proud. The church should be proud. I'm convinced of this totally. Should be proud to enter into conversation with any religion. You're dealing with people who have been colonized, culturally colonized, okay, first. The religious colonization is a part of the cultural colonization. However, the retention of the African culture is the part that permits them to be able to practice Yoruba and be Catholic, for example. So Jehovah is God, in the church that they go to on Sunday morning, Olodomare might be the God that is in the, at the shrine that they go to in the afternoon. Uh, to these people, they're just two names for the same character. Catholicism was to mask the African practice because uh, most of the slave masters had just come from Europe and they associated anything other than, say, mainly Christian and Catholicism as witchcraft. And in the African frame of mind, the Africans took a viewpoint when they ran into uh, Christianity or Catholicism as the form of the white man's magic. So since they were in a position of servitude and he was their master, he, they felt in some way that their master's magic was just as powerful as their magic so because they found themselves in a position of servitude. So they began to incorporate certain uh, uh, Catholic saints so they were actually masking in the beginning, and as voodoo evolved, actually Catholicism became 50% of voodoo. In um, the Haitian voodoo, Papa Legba is represented by St. Lazarus. St. James Major represents uh, Ogun, the god of metal and warrior god. And Dambala is represented by St. Patrick because of the snakes that are at his feet. So, again, if the slave master were to come in and see a picture of St. Patrick and a white candle going, he would think, well, no, this is benign enough. It's to St. Patrick. Wrong. to Dambala. Oh, yes, we have so much in common. It would be stupid for any of us, Catholic, non-Catholic, Methodist, Baptist. It would be stupid for any of us to disdain the gifts we find in other people, no matter where they are, no matter what their persuasion or religious conviction or condition in life. We have a lot to learn from one another. We who practice uh, both disciplines, we find no conflict in it at all because um, I know in the voodoo, I'm only doing good, and I know when I go to church and I pray to Jesus, I'm only doing good. So when people um, gravitate to me, it's not just um, Ava K. Jones, Voodoo and Yoruba Priestess, that they're seeing, they're seeing Ava K. Jones Christian as well. The schisms of Western life present us with either or propositions, constantly choices that are either this or that. For the African mind, if something is good, you should not have to match it against something else that is good to find out what is best. You should be able to take all of those things and bring them into your life to make it that much fuller. Through 
centuries of repression and disdain, voodoo has somehow survived in New Orleans. Part formal religion, part tourist attraction, part and parcel of the daily rituals for good luck that most of us deny, but that deep down many of us believe in. This is New Orleans Voodoo from the inside. had a male relative that used to bring his hair home from the barber shop wrapped up in a handkerchief and he would burn it at home. They said that if the barber swept your hair outside, the birds would get it out of the trash or wherever he put it and they would weave it into a nest and drive you crazy. You know, there was a great voodoo story that I heard once about a guy who wanted to take it out of his neighbor, so he made uh, he made a grigri. And he took the grigri and he threw it under the man's house. And for a while it caused some problems, but finally this dog happened to come along because there was some bones and other things in the grigri. His own dog happened to smell it, this thing under this other house, went back and got it and brought it and put it under his house. And he had bad luck because of it. <laughs> 